Hey, Pastor Steve Waldron here. A rather new Bible commentary, the Moody Bible commentary. This is going to be from a relatively conservative viewpoint, you know, in the realm and spectrum of evangelicalism. This would be on the conservative side. Probably wouldn't be what they would consider fundamentalist, if you know what I'm saying, but really close to that. And Moody Press traditionally comes out with a lot of good series. You know, they publish the Ryrie Study Bible. They've got the NAC series, I think is the name of it, of where they have all kinds of conservative subjects. This is kind of a big one volume commentary. I'm a big fan of one volume uh, commentaries as well. So we're going to take a look on the inside of this. Now, the general editors are Michael Radinick and Michael Van Lanningham, of which I don't know anything about either one of those people. I did go to Moody Bible Institute years ago. So, like Erwin Lutzer, senior pastor, Moody Memorial Church, Chicago, Jerry Jenkins, who did the Left Behind series with Tim LaHaye, Joel Rosenberg, New York Times bestselling author, James McDonald, Janet Parshall, which I like Janet Parshall a lot. You don't hear her on the radio as much. Uh, Paul Inns, that's not Peter Inns, by the way, Paul Inns. These are all people who recommend this. Tony Evans, who I really like Tony Evans a lot. Joe Stowell, President Cornerstone University, Grand Rapids, which I didn't even know that. He used to be at Moody Church as well. And uh, several other people here. Um, so let's take a look on the inside here. This was done in 2014. And so the Bible translations are going to use here are the NASB, uh, the latest edition, 95. I think they're updating that, by the way. The ESV, 2001. The NIV, uh, up through 2011. The NLT, up to 2007. The Holman Christian Standard Bible, up to 2003. Um, and uh, managing editor was Alan Scholes. Christopher Reese was an editor. I wonder if that's with the Reese Study Bible, like a son of that. Okay, so um, here's uh, like a statement of purpose. Is we hope you enjoy this book from Moody Publishers. Our goal is to provide high-quality, thought-provoking books and products that connect truth to your real needs and challenges. So that's kind of a good statement. And... Uh, also, I think it's students from Moody that do the Pacific Garden Mission, which is one of my favorite shows of all time. Like, I wish on old time radio they would do the, my wife has XM in her vehicle, that they would do the Pacific Garden Mission. There's some station here in Albany that does it when I'm on the way to church sometimes. I, I don't catch it all the time. And they are just fantastic. All right. And I'm sure some of you like the Pacific Garden Mission as well. I had a friend of mine uh, years ago that uh, one of uh, his, his life story was in the Pacific Guard mission on Unshackled. That's the name of it. Unshackled. Oh, I like those stories, you know. But uh, they're not apostolic, but they're, they're good stories. They're neat to hear. All right, so it does give a list. We ought to do that, the list of contributors. Sorry, I've got a folded page here. Sometimes when you're trying to get so much information into a small book like this, and when I say small, that's in relative terms, really huge, but it's, you know, thousands of pages kind of thing, that the pages you have to use do wrinkle easily. They do wrinkle easily. This looks like, I'm trying to see... It, do, it looks like it's a glued binding. It doesn't look like it's Smithsonian. I could be wrong on that. A lot of books today are Smithsonian. So this has over a million and a half words, 2,000 pages. So, I mean, it's a big deal. It's a very big undertaking here. So uh, let's take a look. I've been reading through it. I really like a lot of what I'm reading. Boy, look at that Roy Zuck. I'm a, 
I'm a big Roy Zuck fan in a lot of ways. He writes a lot of things. Here's also a list of abbreviations. Sometimes that's a kind of a cool thing because you get a, a, a feel for the sources they used. So this is done by the faculty. I remember when I was up at IBC, I always, and I'm still at IBC, but on a adjunct uh, deal now that I tried to get us to do one of these, like either a study Bible or a commentary, a one volume commentary on the Bible, Indiana Bible College. I think we could have done a good one. I mean, when you've got Brother Brown, Brother Kilman, Brother Massengale, and uh, different people, Brother French at the time, Brother Romine at the time, um, I think it could have just been in a, a phenomenal, phenomenal product here. So, Old Testament, Genesis by Michael G. Wexler, introduction, author, and then it's got the traditional view. The Pentateuch, Pentateuch claims this for itself, uh, mosaic authorship. And this is a tour de force of uh, a... Uh, internal view for mosaic authorship but then it does go into the Wellhausian hypothesis which is also known as the documentary hypothesis which you might also see as JEPD at sometimes which would stand for the Jehovah's the Elohimist the priestly case and the Deuteronomist okay so the date 1446 so that would be good um, I'm still, I'm not conclusively at a 1446 date. I'm more, I still lean more towards Usher of 1491-ish, you know, but 1446 is still a very conservative view, and I'm not against that view per se. Um, so the days of creation, we're going to see... Uh, if there are six day creationists here, um, it does seem they're really six day creationists here. Fourth of Ten Commandments logically implies all six days of creation. Gives really a, a great thing for six day creationism. Excellent. I would say. And then a lot of people are into outlines. I have not been to this point in my life. I may get into outlines. Now, I've always enjoyed John Phillips' outlines in the Exploring series by John Phillips. That's one of the uh, commentary sets that I really recommend. And uh, he has alliterative outlines, which I really like. But I'm not a huge outline person. Uh, you know, when I first got born again of water and spirit, I was into the open study Bible quite a bit, as well as Thompson. I had friends of mine, John and Stephanie Honeycutt. I still use that Bible. They bought, uh, I'll keep showing you the outlines while I'm talking. Um, me, my first Thompson chain from, I think, a Baptist bookstore there in Jackson, Mississippi. God bless John and Stephanie. Hallelujah. I think they're in Florida. And... Uh, but it had good outlines, and the Open Bible had excellent outlines. And uh, I'm just such a big Open Bible fan. I'm making this in August, August 26th, the Monday. And we do several videos at one time and then just schedule them out. That's how this whole deal works. And I know through August, I think, CBD had the hardback Open Bible, which kind of combines, Nelson combines the old and the new, or the Open Bible Expanded Edition, with their first Open Bible. You get the best of both worlds for $19.99. That's a good deal. All right, primeval history establishing the need for creation. And so this is just an absolute incredible uh, uh, introduction to Genesis. What can I say about this? Um, Uh, I'm trying to see if he believes in the gap theory here. I haven't looked at that before now. Let's, let me just read this paragraph out loud here. However, 
how can something that was just created, thus implying both form and substance, have at the same time neither form nor substance? This being the plain meaning of the expression formless and void. Moreover, the idea that verse 2 presents the earth in an unfinished or semi-finished state runs contrary to the way in which God created everything else in this chapter, namely immediately and completely without any suggestion of a pause during which the creative act remains an unfinished or incomplete creation. Um, so I would have to read more on that, see if they believe in the gap theory. I'm thinking they don't, but they might, because I think Schofield does, and they run the Schofield uh, course. So let me just flip this back here. And this is how it's going to look. And it's going to look a lot like the Bible knowledge commentary that it's just going to take like phrases the phrases will be in bold and then the commentary around it will be you know just really good so let's go to uh, exodus and see when we get to exodus what we're looking at here exodus introduction by kevin d zuber and i do like this at the end of the book it has a uh, bibliography and these bibliographies so that at the end of Genesis it's got a bibliography and then this is the beginning of Exodus um, of other usually with a conservative viewpoint like Moody is going to have they're also going to be cessationist I remember when I was going to them I had the Holy Ghost spirit filled and they sent out a thing saying if you got the Holy Ghost we don't want you at Moody I was like oh man <laughs> Then they came out with Moody Monthly, kind of a thing against oneness. And it was the baptism of Jesus, which is really nothing against oneness. It's shocking to me, you know, how often in comment sections on the various videos we've done, thousands over the years, that uh, people are still saying, well, how do you explain the baptism of Jesus? Well, I've made videos, I think multiple videos on that. But it's actually just the omniscience of God, the omnipresence of God, more specifically. And, I mean, it's like, I've got the Holy Ghost, you've got the Holy Ghost, other people have the Holy Ghost, and God's still in heaven. This doesn't imply multiple gods. So, obviously, God on the throne a dove coming and God in Jesus, the Father in Jesus Christ, doesn't imply three persons at all. You know what I'm saying? I mean, this is this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. That's a very oneness statement or a very deity of Jesus Christ statement, as it were. Okay, so uh, really good introduction another outline amazing outline pages long and then the commentary on exodus starts just turn like to first kings bibliography for first kings so you can buy this now really inexpensive on uh, ebay but it's it's maintained i will say this i haven't it hasn't gone to the 399 section at thrift books last time i saw on ebay so it's maintained its value but especially if uh you don't just want something absolutely perfect i'll show you psalms here what's going on at psalms and then we're going to see two things we're going to see if it's got um something in between the old and the new testament and then we're also going to see if uh it harmonizes the gospels in its commentary which i doubt it does but we're going to see if it does so let's go to malachi malachi the italian prophet as he's called boy i'm sitting here looking through nahum and all this this looks so good the bible is simple enough for everyone to understand but it has so much in it that it, a lifetime you can't mine everything out of it that is just a truism so there is nothing out in between so it doesn't have like between the testaments thing just brings you to matthew um and here we have like redaction criticism may have more to offer than source or for crimin uh, criticism for it's demonstrable that one gospel writer draws attention to certain things that are not emphasized by the others and vice versa <laughs> you know of course i just don't believe any of this so I believe like holy men of old moved as they were uh, spake as they were moved by the holy ghost this is what i think oh scriptural I, wow okay um 
so I do appreciate this. There are several dangers associated with more radical and critical approaches to redaction criticism. That's good. Great outline. So it's not harmonizing the Gospels as we go. Acts. So let's go to Acts. Let's see what's going on in Acts here. Let's go to like Acts 2.38 and see what they have to say at Acts 2.38. All right. Repent, Lo and Nida. That's Eugene Nida. How about that? Who does like international Bible translating? Um, Though in English, a focal component of repent is the sorrow of contrition that a person experiences because of sin. The emphasis in the Greek words to repent and repentance seems to be more specifically the total change, both in thought and behavior, with respect to how one should both think and act. So that's good. Oh, and they're quoting Daryl Bach. That's a good thing. Uh, Daryl Bach notes that repentance and faith are two sides of the same coin. Well, that, that's revelatory to some. That's good. Peter introduces two new elements. First, he said baptism must now be in the name of Jesus. This means a commitment to an identification with Jesus as Lord and Christ. For an explanation for why the name of the triune God is not used in the baptismal formula here, see the comments on Matthew 28, 19. Second, he promised him the gift of the Holy Spirit. This is the Spirit himself. Um, some believe that both repentance and baptism are required for the forgiveness of sins. This view, however, is inconsistent with overall teaching of Scripture. In addition, forgiveness, the same word, uh, is promised without baptism to those who respond appropriately. The grammatical instruction of the sentence does not import this idea. That's a whole different thing. So, uh, let's see what Matthew 28, 19 says. Since he said turn there. Okay, name. Name is a singular noun, not names, giving an implicit witness to the triunity of God. None of the baptism in Acts utilizes the Trinitarian formula. So that's good that it admits that, because like many times in the Church of God, they'll try to say that when it says in the name of Jesus, it meant Matthew 28, 19. Um, okay. Perhaps because Jesus was not imparting a baptismal formula at all, he was describing Christian baptism as demonstrating belief in the triune God as its fundamental referent. Um, so, baptizing, teaching is a present participle, then along with the present participle, baptizing gives the primary means whereby Jesus' followers make disciples. Wow, so you can't be a disciple of Jesus unless you've been baptized. That's good. And then he's saying, they just totally admit Matthew 28, 19 is not a baptismal formula. They have some other things in there that I would disagree with. That's a talk for another time. This is a review of this particular book. Wow, so let's see. Let's see how it deals kind of with 1 Corinthians 11. Let's go there. 1 Corinthians 12, gifts of the Spirit. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 11. Um, boy, it's tough to find uh, the woman whose head is shaved with one who earned a reputation of being immoral from the ancient sources. Uh, see Garland, 1 Corinthians 5.21, winter after Paul left Corinth. See, that's good because I've got this deal of over 200 references from the ancient world, but they looked at like long hair on men as being wild. It was crazy to them. Okay, long hair is a glory to her in that it is a mark of her respectability and femininity. Her hair is given her by God as not instead of a glorious covering, which was not intended for men. For a woman to reject this God-given sign of respectable femininity was to reject her identity and role as a Christian woman. Uh, someone might object that long hair was not always a dishonor for men, as in the case of the Spartan warriors and Nazarites, but Paul was not writing to Spartans and Nazarites. In cultures where hair length is not tied to specific gender, believers should embrace their culture symbols, blah, blah, blah. So instead of appealing to creation, they appeal to culture, which is not a good thing, because we would... Paul seems to be saying it's for creation. It's a creative thing, not a cultural thing. Um, it was a dishonor for a man to have long hair in first century Corinth. 
Uh, if a man had long hair, he was perceived negatively as attempting to feminize himself. So that's kind of interesting. Let's go to Deuteronomy 22.5. Let's see what that says. This is called, in parlance, in South Georgia, a rabbit trail. We're on a rabbit trail right now. So Deuteronomy 22.5, let's see what this says. But it's a good rabbit trail. I've got a friend, Brother Hodge, in Savannah. He trains rabbit dogs, you know. All right. Next, a law prohibiting cross-dressing and transvestite practices may seem out of place in the context, but Moses was slowly transitioning to purity laws and taboo mixtures or mixed messages. Some have suggested that cross-dressing was sometimes used in pagan fertility rituals, and the Israelites were to maintain their separateness from pagan practices at all times. Others see this as legislation as uh, seeking to discourage homosexuality. Whatever the background, the theme of purity and exposed norms stands out. Wearing clothing of the opposite sex sends a mixed message and thus is prohibited. Well, that's kind of interesting. Let's go to 1 Timothy 2.9. Let's see what's there. 1 Timothy 2.9. There's so many that we could go on the catching away. I'm going to assume they're going to go kind of with a pre-trib rapture stance kind of deal. Because that's moody. Moody and Scoville. You know, Andrew Urshan went to Moody for a while. They actually sponsored his his mission. Brother, uh, I've got it down here somewhere. Brother Urshan, I mean, Brother Seagrave's book phenomenally brings out uh, Urshan's time at Moody. He did a great historical thing, Brother Seagrave's did. Okay, um, so 2 9, 1 Timothy. The context for the teaching in 9 through 15 continues to be the public and corporate gathering of the church, even if it's in smaller home gatherings. Women who pray in the assembly must dress modestly and discreetly. Peter echoes Paul's emphasis on good works as a mean of adornment. 1 Peter 3.3, 3, these admonitions address extravagances of dress and hairstyle that were typical of wealthy women. The command to learn quietly is mirrored elsewhere in contexts that include men and address problems of disruptive behavior. And then he gives scripture. So that's not bad. That's pretty good. wonder how it does on Colossians 2.9. Whoa, that'll be an interesting thing. I'd also like to go into Philippians 2. I need to do like a video on Philippians 2, 5 through 11 sometime. Somebody's asked me to. So, 2.8. Uh, False teachings the Colossians faced were based on mere human tradition rather than on Christ. The Colossians and all believers have been made complete in Him and that they have, among other blessings, forgiveness, reconciliation, and new life. They need no other source of spiritual wealth, since the fullness of deity dwells in him. See 119. So as fully God and fully man, he is the head over all, including the elemental forces. Let's see what 119 says. Um, Christ has first place in both original creation and in the new creation because the Father was pleased for full and complete deity, the fullness, to take up resonance, dwell in Him, thus the God-man. That's good. It's very difficult to twist those scriptures, you know. It's, they're just plain. Let's see what John 14, 9 says. You know, and as we're turning there, I will say, we won't even go into John 3, 5 at this time. You know, the print is good. There's almost no ghosting. It's very easy to read. Um, I like the commentary. It's conservative. Um, I don't like the fact that uh, it's cessationist, though. All right. To know or see Christ, who has seen me, is to recognize God himself fully has seen the Father. God the Father is completely revealed in Jesus the Son. Um, but Jesus the Son Son of God is distinct from God the Father in terms of their respective personhood <sighs> so that's kind of unique I would not uh, agree with that the Father abiding in Christ this mutual indwelling uh, stresses inseparability see I would say that's flesh and spirit they're trying to say it's two spirits so Titus 2.13, that'll be a good one. 
Titus 2.30. So it's going to be decent on certain things, going to be really good in other areas, going to be not so good in just like pure apostolic doctrine. So Titus 2.13 the deity of Christ is queer, clearly affirmed in verse 13. He is both God, possessing all the divine attributes of God the Father, but a distinct person from God the Father. See, it just seems like they're just trying to say what the Bible does not say. Um, and then it talks about the rapture of the church. So let's see how many pages this has. A lot in Revelation here. It is 2,027 pages of commentary. Now, this is excellent. And see, like the bibliography sections, that's really worth it. Like I'm looking at Joseph Seiss, the Apocalypse, you know, and so George, Gregory Beale, excuse me, the Book of Revelation. So this would be a great way to build your library. Even John Walver, they have Randy Alcorn on Heaven, Gleason Archer, Paul Feinberg and Doug Moo, Three Views on the Rapture, Pre, Mid, or Post. But then this scripture index at the back. So like, let's say you're studying Genesis 126. You can turn to the back and it's going to have a very large section showing not just where that initially is, but where it is everywhere where it's quoted throughout the entire text so that is another invaluable tool invaluable tool. it talks about charts that clearly explain biblical context maps overviews um, I haven't seen a lot of that I'm gonna guess it's in there though um, they obviously wouldn't advertise if it wasn't in there and let's see after this, there is a subject index that is extraordinarily helpful in a work like this, like Chanaka, which would also be Hanaka. So you'd have to know whether they're spelling it Chanaka or Kanaka rather than Hanaka. So, I mean, at the end of the day, this is one of those foundational conservative commentaries. Obviously, it's not multi-volume so it's not going to be able to go into the discussion areas it's not going to be like a 50 volume set it's not going to be like the word biblical commentary on and on and so forth and there's so many commentaries that are out there today but just for a good student of the word of God you know if you're coming from a Pentecostal apostolic perspective like me you're going to have to eat the food spit out the sticks but no it's going to have a lot of good stuff in here a lot of great information so so the uh, Moody one volume biblical commentary, again, if you want a multi-volume commentary from Moody, they do have that. And I think Moody also publishes MacArthur's commentaries as well. So uh, Dwight Moody, um, massive, I mean, if you, massive, I shouldn't say that, but if you want to study, I mean, the effect he had on American a culture in the late 19th century just amazing and a lot of people from Moody Church ended up getting the Holy Ghost and getting baptized in Jesus name over the course of time and so they've kind of been this pillar of American uh, Christianity and kind of fundamentalist for a large part you know Billy Sunday fundamentalist uh, for a large part of the 20th century gradually be, went kicking and screaming into the evangelical world but they would be the conservative counterpoint to Wheaton which Wheaton Billy Graham's University has gradually gone more and more less conservative so God bless talk with you later in Jesus name